If you all would turn to Romans 13. I'd like to, we only have a few verses, but boy, they are so wonderful. I've been trying to memorize this section and <clears throat> haven't gotten there yet. Um, if you'll humor me, I, I've, uh, I'm, I'm learning it in the New King James. It, it works for me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some of this. You can follow it along. It's not that much different in the New American Standard. <clears throat> but he says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you have not, you have not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, or all summed up in this saying, saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. So many of these words have just been ringing in my ears for the last week. It's what, and, and again, I, I, I've been late, since we've been in the first part of chapter 12, when he says to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He hasn't changed the subject. He's not gone on to anything different. Mm -hmm. He's talked about how how would we not conform to this world, but transformed as he talked about spiritual <coughs> gifts. Um, and, and, and then as he talks about how in, in, in chapter 12, in verse 9, he says, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And he goes on in that beautiful section. He goes on later in the chapter, and he talks about how that we're to be forgiving one another. Well, that's just talking about loving one another again. That's just another way of saying it, that we're... We're to love one another to the point of forgiving uh, whatever might come up. And then what we talked about last week is might seem like he's going off on something different, but he's not really because he's talking about how we live in this world, how we function in this world, and how we, how we live a life of love. And one of them is that we live uh, according to outsiders, that we not bring reproach upon the church of Christ and upon the name of Christ. And so... We're to have respect for government officials and we're to have respect for all those that are in authority and we're to honor them and we're to bless them and we're to pray for them and, and do all of those things. But then here, and then, and then in verse 7, he said to render to, to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. In other words, nobody is to be able to take offense because we haven't done the proper things. We haven't lived our life properly according to the society around us. Now, if there's something, if that involves something that's against Scripture, then obviously we can't go there. But if it's not, um, you know, uh, we don't need to be griping about our taxes and we have to pay taxes. Praise God we have money to pay taxes, yes. you know, uh, that kind of thing. Um, we're, we're not to be continually griping about the things of, that the world is being the world. But then, then he takes that whole thing uh, about um, how we're to owe different ones. We're to render all uh, that's due, tax to whom tax is due. And then he says, verse 8, owe no one anything or owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. Now, now, some have taken this to mean that we're to never incur any kind of debt. And I respect, there's a lot of people that have over the years believed that. I've, I've mentioned George Mueller a number of times as being somebody uh, from the past that I just have a great admiration for. And he took that as literally as you could possibly take it. That was like his life verse. And he believed that that meant that you should never have any kind of debt. And God actually honored that belief in him. I, I don't see it that way necessarily. I think he's saying that you're not that, that we're to pay our bills. We're to pay. We're not to incur a debt that we can't pay, uh, which is a good. Now, not 
encourage that at all is really a good thing. But his point is not about the debt. His point is that we're to, we owe others love. That what we owe is love to others. That when we see someone out there, whoever they are, this is in other places uh, that we've read, he talks about loving one another within the church body. But this is much broader here. He's not only just talking about within the body, he's talking about our neighbors, our every, everybody that's out there. Mm -hmm. Who is our neighbor? It's, it's who, whoever's in need, whoever needs to hear the gospel, whoever needs to hear love, to, to feel love from us. And so um, we owe them love. It, if, if we could keep that in our minds, if I could keep it in my mind and heart that everyone that I meet, if it's the person that's checking me out, or if it's the person at the, at, the, at the doctor's office or the person I'm on the phone, that I owe this person love. I owe them love. Why do I owe them love? Why do we owe people that we've never met or maybe are not very nice to us, maybe are ugly to us or rude to us, and are, we're tempted to act that way to us, why would we owe them love? Because God first showed His love for us. Yes, ma'am. And so we need to share. We need to share His love to others. Yeah, you got yeah. that, honey. Mm -hmm. Very good. Good answer. Amen. And we love. He commanded it. He didn't suggest it. No, that's right. Right. It's because of His love for us that we're compelled to love others. Um. This reminds me. If I can find it, there's a scripture in. I wasn't expecting to go here, so bear with me. I think it's in 2 Corinthians. In one of the Corinthians. Yes. Just a few verses in 2 Corinthians 5. Um, we all know this part. In, in, in the 17th verse, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away, the whole new things have come. But here's what he said a little bit before this. Verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Now, that, I, I know this again here. I, I know this more in the, in the King James. It says the love of Christ constrains us. And that word literally means it binds us together. It binds us together. The love of Christ that we have of Christ binds us together not only with those in the body of Christ, but even those outside the body of Christ. It constrains us, which means in a way it restrains us from doing things that would bring reproach upon the body. And it, it binds us together in love with them because we know that Jesus Christ died for us and He died for them. And even if they're not walking in Christ then, it is our responsibility to share the love of Christ with them. Not only by our words, but by our actions, by our love. So we're loving the unlovable because we were the unlovable and we were loved. Mm -hmm. Man. Mm -hmm. oh, man. And so He says, Oh, no man anything but to love one another. And then... You know, I think about this. I mean, Paul spent chapters earlier in this talking about the theological implications of love and the love of God. And th that was needful and right that he did that. But now we have the whole thing. It's like he's compressed all those chapters about love and the love of Christ into this little tiny, wonderful verse or two. And it says so much because now he's not just talking about the theological part, which is important, but he's talking about the the day to day implications of what this means to us. And so he says, and I'm going back to the New Record Standard here. Oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law for this. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. If there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So, when we don't have, people say, well, are we under the Ten Commandments or not? Well, yes and no. <laughs> it's, uh, if, it's like if, if you are, 
if you're an, if it's an athlete and you're called to be a pole vaulter and, and you jump 20 feet, you've also jumped 10 feet, haven't you, or five feet. You've, you've cleared that this is a higher bar, but when you've cleared 20, you've also cleared 10 and you've cleared five. You've done all those. These are, those are the lower things. The higher things are love. You know, you can, you can do all these things. You cannot commit adultery, and you cannot steal, and you cannot commit murder in the, in the, in, in the, um, in the technical sense, and yet not love. But if you love somebody, you're not going to do those things. I mean, it's just, that's, you, you see the difference in those. That's the law of love trumps the law of the Old Testament. But that doesn't mean that the law of the Old Testament, the law of God in the Old Testament is not being followed. It's being followed better because it's being followed by love. And so he says, verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. So love is the fulfillment of the law. When we are loving our neighbors, when we're loving our fellow men and women as ourselves, we're keeping the law. We don't have to worry about, am I doing this? Am I following this law? Am I keeping this? Am I doing the right thing? We are in when we're loving. Mm -hmm. We're pleasing God when we're loving. And isn't that what it's all about? Mm -hmm. It's about pleasing God. We can get so caught up in, should we do this and should we do that? Love will lead the way. Love will lead the way. Amen. Um, so anyone, before we move on from that, anyone have any, any thoughts about what we've talked about so far? Pastor Mike? I, I agree with everything. It's wonderful. The only thing that I would add, and it's just a personal thing with me, uh, as a musician, when you were talking about the love of God constrains, you know, the, 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 the C-O-N, when you see it with music, it, it means with, it means, to me, it means he, the love restrains us with our approval. Yeah. Which, which is a, it doesn't restrain me. It doesn't, no, it doesn't restrain me without my permission. It I am embracing his restraining. Mm -hmm. I'm working yeah. with him. And so when we love, it's, it's we're doing because we choose to do, we choose to be bound by that. And it, it, it's the difference between obeying because you're gonna get punished if you don't, and obeying because it's the heart of what's right and what you love. You know? Amen, amen, that's so good. By the way, you two look really cute together. Oh, yes. <laughs> I just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> Wait till next week. It wasn't <laughs> accidental. It's good. It's it's <laughs> yeah, that's right, <laughs> Brittany. You preach it, girl. Well, you're sharp tonight, Brittany. Uh, yeah, exactly. Wow. You're on a roll, girl. <laughs> yeah. So, it seems like, and, and I've read a little bit, I didn't read too much of other people's thoughts about it, but. <laughs> the idea is that he's changed the subject in verse 13 of verse 11 and now he's talking about waking up out of sleep. But the more I looked at this, I thought, no, he, he hasn't changed the subject at all. He's talking, he's still talking about how to love. He's talking about the practical, how practically love. You can't, this kind of love, this is the agape love, this is the love of God to men and to women, and this is the love that we're to share. You can't do it casually. You can't do it in happenstance. You can't sort of love. This has to be an intentional love that only can happen when we're fully awake and fully engaged every moment of every day. It's not, it's not something that we can do uh, in our spare time. It's something we have to work at because it goes against every human inclination Sure. to love that way. To put others above ourselves, to love our neighbor as ourselves, and really more than ourselves, to always, because you remember what he said in verse in chapter 12. Um, he said, 
verse 16, he says, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. And uh, so we have to be, when we're loving, we can't be loving from an elevated position down to somebody. We're, we have to be loving from below. And so we have to make ourselves low so that we can love someone. And that's always against our own inclination. So waking up, he says, knowing the time. Do this. I like that. Just do this. Knowing the time. Knowing what time it is. You know, it's really important as Christians that we know what time it is. Mm-hmm. Not so much what time of the day it is, but what season are we in? What do we, when we see, when we look out in the world, what do we see? Do we see light and brightness and we see things getting better and better all the time? Not hardly. He says, here, it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. Now, it seems, when when I read Paul's writings and Peter's writings in the New Testament, it, it seems that they expected the return of Christ to be pretty imminent. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that they would be shocked that we're still here 2,000 years later. <laughs> but all generations of Christians are to expect the imminent return of Christ. Mm-hmm. And I believe our generation has more right to believe that in any generation that's ever been. Sure. For many reasons. Uh, and, and one of them, just right off the top of my head, is that there have been no generation until this one and the previous where the Israel has been reconstituted. And I, that's a sign right there that, that the end must be close. But so many different reasons. But we have to know that the time is short. You know, if you know your time is short, you're going to act differently, aren't you? If, if, you, if you were to know that you only had a year left in your life, say, if you knew it, how would you spend the next year? Or if you only knew you had a month, how would you spend it? Who, I mean, what would you be, what would you be, would you be taking inventory of your life and, 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 and would I, you know, would I be spending it on this thing and that thing that are really worthless? Or would I be digging in with everything I've got? Well, he's saying that's the way we need to live our whole life. Um, our salvation, one thing is for sure, our salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. It's closer. Mm-hmm. And the, the return of Christ is 2,000 years closer than it was when Paul wrote that. Mm-hmm. We know that for a fact. And then he says, I, I love the way this is said in verse 12 and in the King James, the New King James is very similar. He says, the night is far spent and the day is at hand, or the night is almost gone. The night of man's reign, of Satan's reign in the lives of humanity is almost gone. The day is dawning. So what do we do during the day? What are we, if we have our bed clothes on, we have our pajamas on, if it's daytime, that's not the right time to be laying around in bed. It's time to get up. That's what Paul's saying. It's time to get up. But he's saying it's time to get up to love. It's time to get up and do what we've been talking about. It's time to, uh, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. It's time to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's time to put aside these foolish things that we once lived in. Now this, this brings to mind, there's a couple of scriptures where that Paul uh, writes to other people and he expands on the same thing that he's talking about here. And I'd like to, um, I'd like to turn to Ephesians 5. We'll skip around a little bit. Um, but, but there's a few things here that really helped me a lot, and, and, I, and I hope you'll see this. Beginning with verse 1, Ephesians 5. Uh, who has that? Mary Lou, would you read 1 through 3, please? Yes. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality 
or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Okay, so there's the connection between, we, we saw this in chapter 12, the connection between love, loving others, and holy, personal holiness. And here we have it again. He says, "Be imitate God as beloved children and walk in love. Uh, one version has it this way. Live a life of love. I love that. Live a life of love, just as Christ loved you. We are compelled, constrained by the love of Christ to, do, to, to love and to, be, to live holy lives. We live holy lives not to be holy, but we live holy lives so that we can love. If we, and, and, and I'm, I'm going back to uh, chapter 13, when, um, when he talks about laying aside uh, the deeds of darkness and putting on the armor of light, and then he said, to behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sens sensuality, and not in strife and jealousy. So we don't do those things so that we can love. We could restrain ourselves out of law so that we're good, upstanding citizens and not love. But we, when we're, one of the, I was thinking about all these, this list of things that he gives us. Uh, you know, as good, upstanding church people, we wouldn't think about carousing and drunkenness and sexual promiscuity and sensuality, but the church sure has its strife and jealousy, doesn't it? You know, we can, we can get the, these, these big headline sins, but he, he threw in these things like strife and jealousy or envy. And yet, and we see the church as a whole sometimes, thank God, I, I trust not here, but full of those things. Strife, by the way, just means agitated all the time. Wanting to have my own way. Sticking up for myself. He says that doesn't belong in the church of God. It doesn't belong in God's people. It doesn't work for us. It doesn't work for anybody, but it doesn't work for us. Jealousy in the body of Christ, it's all, he, he names this just as, just, just as bad as drunkenness and sexual promiscuity and all those things. It's just as bad. And it demeans the name of Christ and it keeps us from love. Because when you're doing those things, what are, if, if there's one characteristic of all these works of darkness, if you will, to me, that, that is the same in all of them, and it's self, selfishness. Right. Mm -hmm. They're all about me. They're all about what I want. They're all about standing up for myself, finding myself, enjoying myself, loving me as myself. And if I'm doing that, I can't love my neighbor as myself. I can't love others because I'm focused on me. And I'm trying to please me. And if I can please me and please you at the same time, well, by golly, that would be wonderful. But if somebody's got to be pleased, it's going to be me first. That's, if that attitude is in the church, then that is deadly. Mm -hmm. It is. Boys. But the opposite. We restrain ourselves from watching that TV program that we, don't, we know we shouldn't be watching. We restrain ourselves from... Uh, gazing at something out in public that we know we shouldn't be watching or, or going in a certain direction that we know wouldn't be good. We restrain ourselves because it keeps us from loving. And loving is what we're called to do. And we could go, there's a lot of other, you could, I, I would encourage you in your time, if you, I'm not going to go here, we're out of time, it's after eight already, but, uh, if you would just read the whole fifth chapter of Ephesians and then also the third chapter of Colossians because he says much the same thing in, in all of those. Um, but I love the way he wraps this up in verse 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he, he talks here about in verse 12, lay aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light, now, what does that make you think of when he talks about the armor of light in the Bible? Is there any place else where he talks about armor? You remember something about the armor of God? Mm -hmm. Ephesians, we, yeah, the breastplate of righteousness and, and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit and all of those things. 
Okay, so he says there, he names all these that we're to put on. But here, he just says, put on Jesus. Doesn't that just get it? Mm -hmm. Put on Jesus Christ. If you're putting on Jesus Christ, you got, you're getting it. In other words, if you're doing as he does, you're going to have all that. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Don't give the flesh an out. Don't let it have its way. Because if you don't, because if you let it have its way, you can't love. And love is the fulfillment of the law. Praise God. Isn't that simple? It really is. Yeah. It's yeah. really yeah. good. The, the wonderful right. things that Paul is saying here, it's just, it, it's just hard to get to the depth of it, but we, we can only get to the surface. But we're going to see that when we go into chapter 13. <coughs> All of this, we're still talking about love, about how to love. Isn't it wonderful that he didn't just tell us to love, but he didn't tell us how to love? Mm -hmm. He did tell us how to love. And there's, there's no greater thing. There's no... There's, when you get to love, you've gotten to everything. There, there's, there's nothing higher than that. So, thank you for loving one another Loving me and listening tonight. Anybody have any thoughts? Yeah, uh, yeah sure. Ephesians 5 and what was the other one? Oh, uh, yes. Colossians uh, 3. Okay. You, the whole chapter, really. Pastor Mike, do you have anything? Yeah, this has really been wonderful. It's really Amen. been real and good Christ. and right and wholesome and anointed and Christ. helpful and <coughs> blessed. Yeah, praise God. Enjoyable. You're very, yes, and you're very loving. <laughs> and I'm glad that I'm here to be a part of it. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, me too. I'm glad. I'm glad that I got in on it too. Actually, this is one of those scriptures where like you just read it and it's just it's just there. You know? Yeah. It really is. Praise God. It really is. So, our assignment tonight is to go out and love. Yeah. Maybe. And then come back next week and 